the days of conflict between the superpowers have ended. But the task of preserving the peace is more complex than ever. The RAF today stands in readiness to defend not just Britain's interests, but those of her allies. But who are the future enemies? Where will they be fought? And what future weapon does the RAF need to fulfill its role in the 21st century? In 1969, Britain's strategic nuclear deterrent passed from the V bomber force to the nuclear submarines of the Royal Navy. From that point, the RAF became primarily a tactical force geared towards the defense of Western Europe in association with the other armed services and with Britain's allies. In the event of conflict between the superpowers, it was unlikely that either side would launch an immediate nuclear strike. Instead, NATO's forces were geared to repulse a massive conventional Soviet attack into Western Europe. RAF strategy and aircraft had evolved accordingly to meet this threat. Alert, Southern QRA. By 1980, there were eight squadrons in mainland Britain equipped with American-built Phantom Interceptors and British-built Lightnings. However, warning of such a surprise Soviet attack was entrusted to a 30-year-old piston-engine aircraft, the Shackleton. Intruding Soviet bombers and spy planes were detected by the Shackleton's ancient but still effective radar. With the intruder displayed on their screens, its operators then vectored fighters to intercept. Star the 360. Target 015 at 30,000. There are three, Roger. This Phantom has intercepted and is shadowing the Soviet Badger maritime reconnaissance spy plane. As a major maritime power, Britain relies heavily on her sea lanes of communication. At the height of the Cold War, protection of these vital maritime interests was entrusted to Nimrod, named after the Greek mighty hunter. These immense aircraft patrol the skies for many hours, watching for Soviet submarines and surface vessels. Just like German U-boats in World War II, which had so nearly strangled Britain's ability to survive, Soviet submarines could threaten to do the same, blockade Britain's vital sea lanes. It was the Atlantic routes to America that were so important, as ships would be the main mode of transport for the movement of reinforcements and supplies and strength in case of war in Europe. In the event of a confrontation on the high seas, the Nimrods could call in the RAF's maritime strike aircraft, the Buccaneer. Buccaneers had been built originally for the fleet air arm, but were now operated by the RAF. Their mission in the event of war would be to take out the Soviet Navy. These aircraft were perfect for the role. They could fly close to the speed of sound at ultra-low level and fire their Martell air-to-surface missiles from a range of up to 35 miles. In Europe, the RAF was ready, together with its NATO allies, to take on any Soviet aggression directed from the heart of the Warsaw Pact countries. There was a danger that we built the Soviets up to be 10 feet tall when they had um, many failings. 
I think the biggest problem for us would have been the sheer mass of um, Soviet armor. And although we had quality on our side, it was quite likely that we would have been overwhelmed by sheer numerical strength. And that that difficult decision as to whether uh, to go tactical nuclear um, would have had to be taken. If Soviet armor began to roll across the central European plains, NATO aircraft would have to stall the advance while reinforcements were rushed to the front line. They would hit key targets well behind the enemy front line. Supply routes, truck and armored vehicle parks, bridges and airfields would be attacked. This task is known as interdiction. There was therefore a requirement for effective ground attack aircraft. Ideal in the role was the Jaguar, an Anglo-French collaboration which had first entered service with the RAF in 1974. Using a system which guarantees highly accurate navigation at very low level, the Jaguar is fast and excels at delivering its weapons in a first-pass attack. The Jaguar squadrons form the spearhead of Britain's Rapid Reaction Air Force and as such were designed to operate from unprepared airfields and even stretches of motorway in emergency. threat by an aircraft with a truly revolutionary capability. The aircraft that added a new dimension to the service's Cold War capability was the revolutionary Harrier. Developed by Hawker in the 1960s, the GR-1 entered squadron service in April 1969. The Harrier was unique in its ability to take off and land vertically as well as stop in mid-air. It was a real handful to operate. And of course, you had the added dimension of the V-Stol flight regime. And I had never really flown helicopters apart from a two weeks induction course. And there's something slightly unnatural about bringing a high performance combat fighter down below its normal stalling speed. To this day, it remains the only combat aircraft in the West to have this capability. Key to this ability is its unique Rolls-Royce Pegasus turbofan engine. This has four nozzles, which can be vectored or swiveled to suit the particular flight condition. They point downwards for vertical takeoff and landing, and backwards for normal flight. In practice, this uses up valuable fuel and severely limits useful payload. So pilots usually carry out a rolling takeoff and landing. In RAF Germany, its mission has always been close air support for the British Army. In many ways, I would say that the Harrier was the most interesting aircraft that I've operated in the RAF because of the off main base deployment option. And we in Germany at that time, this was 1974-75, were much involved in developing that concept and we could use stretches of road that might be in forests or on the outskirts of villages we could use the villages in which to hide aircraft many of our war sites at that time uh, were in villages themselves so developing that concept was was pioneering stuff this meant that the harrier could be based only minutes away from the ground forces it is supporting giving almost instant air cover Working alongside the other NATO forces, the RAF was at a high state of readiness during the Cold War for an anticipated attack from the east. But in 1982, Britain's forces were called to action in an entirely unexpected quarter. On the 2nd of April, Argentinian forces landed on the Falkland Islands, a British protectorate in the South Atlantic. Fighting a war 8,000 miles from Britain meant that prime responsibility fell to the Royal Navy. 
but such was the value attributed to air power that the RAF was called upon to demonstrate that a long-range attack could be mounted. Operation Black Buck was designed to do precisely that. On the 30th of April, a Vulcan dropped 21 1,000-pound bombs on the airport runway at Port Stanley, the capital of the Falklands. After its sixth airborne refueling from Victor tankers, the Vulcan completed what was then the longest bombing run in history, 7,860 miles, and it landed back at Ascension Island in the central Atlantic. Four further attacks took place over the next few weeks. Although these strikes had only a short-term effect on the capability of the airport, they had a major effect on the deployment of enemy forces. Just as the threat posed by the Lancasters had forced Germany to divert resources away from the front during the Second World War, so these raids caused the Argentinians, fearing similar attacks on their capital, to pull their fighters back to defend Buenos Aires. This psychological victory heralded the start of the campaign to retake the Falklands. With the nearest available British airfield over 3,000 miles away on Ascension Island, carrier-based aircraft were the sole means of providing air power over the Falklands. Therefore, vertical takeoff carriers were the only option. The fleet air arm operated sea harrier fighters as air defence for the carrier task force, while the RAF contributed number one squadron's Harrier GR3 fighter bombers, based on HMS Hearn. The last time that we'd embarked a Harrier was probably back in the days of Bulwark, and there may have been some limited sea trials. Um, so the first move was actually to equip the aircraft for carrier-borne operations, be it shackles, a new nav system, or a national navigation uh, program had to go in. Uh, and we were going down there in an air defence role initially, but we couldn't carry missiles. So a number of modifications uh, which had to be done to the program in pretty short order. Um, having got down there, then there are obviously limitations of the aircraft which were known before, but the conflict confirmed. Uh, short range, limited payload, not a particularly effective nav system, and a very limited self-defense system. And indeed, we lost aircraft down there, the ground fire. Nimrods had two key maritime tasks during the war. To counter the threat posed by Argentinian submarines, and to patrol the 200-mile exclusion zone that Britain had instigated around the islands. Although the campaign to retake the Falklands was ultimately successful, it was not without high cost. A number of Royal Navy ships were sunk, mainly by Argentinian jets armed with French Exocet missiles. They could be fired from many miles away, the lack of an airborne system, warning of impending attack, meant that these enemy jets could get through to the British ships virtually undetected. This lesson only served to reinforce the RAF's search for an aircraft to replace the aging Avro Shackleton. Work was already underway to convert some Nimrod maritime patrollers to fulfill this role. Unfortunately for the RAF, development of the radar systems ran into technical difficulties and the project was scrapped in 1986. The Shackletons would have to soldier on for a further five years. However, the RAF was receiving the first examples of a new strike aircraft. The Tornado GR1 was and still is the backbone of the RAF's frontline force. Developed jointly by Britain, Germany and Italy, it is an advanced all-weather bomber. It has highly sophisticated electronic navigation and attack systems which allows it to follow terrain automatically at high subsonic speeds. The Tornado had a true all-weather uh, low-level strike attack capability because of its modern avionics, apart from anything else, uh, which the previous generation of aircraft did not. So for the first time, it got the RAF into the low-level all-weather game. The strike version was followed later in the 1980s by the Tornado fighter. The F-3 is a classic long-range interceptor designed to replace the phantoms and lightnings that served the RAF for many years. Its role 
was to intercept Soviet bombers and shoot them down if necessary. By the end of the 1980s, the RAF's frontline reorganization was almost complete. They were in good shape to continue their role of defending Western Europe with their NATO allies. But in 1989, everything changed. The breakup of the Soviet Union and the fall of communism led to profound changes for NATO's defense policy. Almost overnight, NATO's main enemy was seeking peace and the whole basis for the West's strategic thinking had become redundant. The British government sought to take advantage of the so-called peace dividend and drastically reduce its defense expenditure. Reductions were proposed that would cut the size of the RAF to its lowest level for 50 years. The document, called Options for Change, was presented to Parliament on the 25th of July, 1990. One week later, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Saddam Hussein's Iraqi forces seemed poised to take over the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and thus strangle the West's oil supplies. Well, funnily enough, I was going on holiday that night and we were crossing the channel in a P&O ferry boat when I heard that Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. And the thought struck me at the time, I may not be on holiday too long. And I was right, within three days I was recalled. As the United Nations passed resolutions condemning the act of aggression, British and American air bases prepared to rush reinforcements to Saudi Arabia and deter further Iraqi incursions. The priority was to send fighters and airborne early warning aircraft. The first aircraft arrived in the Gulf on the 7th of August 1990, AWACS and American F-15s. Four days later, RAF Tornado F-3s landed at Dharan in Saudi Arabia and immediately began flying combat air patrols along the Kuwait border. At this point, the coalition forces were vastly outnumbered by the Iraqi Air Force, which was equipped with highly capable Soviet-built MiG-29s, 25s and French Mirage F-1s. Over a period of four and a half months, Coalition forces in the Gulf were built up on a massive scale. The American code name for this reinforcement was Desert Shield. The RAF's contribution was Operation Granby. In overall charge of the coalition forces was General Norman Schwarzkopf. At his right hand was General Chuck Horner, commander of the Allied Air Forces, whose job it was to gain and keep air superiority before ground troops could begin a land campaign. As airmen, it was very easy to form this coalition. First of all, English is the language of aviation. So even the French people involved spoke English. Uh, Americans not well, but nonetheless, we speak English. Uh, the other thing that airmen do is we're not worried about rigid commands and orders. We have a common set of rules that we follow, and then we adapt our operations to the capabilities of the various airplanes. For example, the shorter range airplanes like the AV-8 or the Jaguars would strike targets in the vicinity of Kuwait and southern Iraq. The stealth aircraft, the 117, was the aircraft we used to go into the heavily defended areas of Baghdad. The backbone of the RAF in the Gulf was the tornado. The 18 F-3 fighters were joined by a formidable strike force of 62 GR-1 bombers. Co-located with some of the tornadoes at Muharraq in Bahrain was a detachment of 12 Jaguars which would provide battlefield air interdiction and close support of the coalition ground troops. Beginning as early as August 1990, Hercules of the Lynham Transport Wing were involved in moving men and supplies to the Gulf. Based in Saudi Arabia during the war, they were used for tactical transportation 
including delivery of supplies to rough forward airstrips. They were to carry nearly 14,000 passengers and seven and a half million pounds of freight during the next few months. The Middle East was a vastly different operating environment from that of Northern Europe, where so many of the RAF aircrew had trained to fight. However, this training had emphasized flexibility, which would be tested to the full in the coming weeks. One thing that did not change for the Tornado bomber crews was low-level training. But now they were not restricted on speed and noise as they had been in Germany. They flew at high subsonic speeds, hugging the sand dunes to prepare for the task ahead. This Tornado infrared camera shows how extreme the conditions could be. In December 1990, the United Nations passed a resolution to liberate Kuwait. When Iraq failed to comply with the UN's demands, Desert Shield became Desert Storm. Horner's staff had planned the Desert Storm air campaign meticulously. One of the great military commanders, Field Marshal von Clausewitz, had said, no plan survives contact with the enemy. But this time, he was proved wrong. The priority was to establish air superiority to provide an umbrella of friendly air cover. Then the strike aircraft could systematically destroy the Iraqi war machine. The first targets were radar, guns and missile installations, as well as the Iraqi air force. The whole array of command and control centers such as military headquarters, communications and supply routes were vital targets. Iraqi forces would not be allowed to respond. At 1.30 on the morning of the 17th of January, 1991, Tomahawk cruise missiles were fired from US Navy warships in the Persian Gulf. They were followed by wave after wave of coalition bombers hitting radar stations and communications. 2,000 targets were hit in the first 10 minutes. At the opening of the air campaign, coalition aircraft hit more targets in one day's attack than the total number of targets by all of the US 8th Air Force in 1942 and 43. That's more separate targets attacked in less time than ever before in history. Any Iraqi aircraft that resisted was either shot down or fled from combat. The RAF Tornado bombers had a special task in this vast scenario. They were to fly in at ultra-low level and destroy Iraq's airfields using the runway-busting JP-233 bombs. These bombs had been specially designed to deliver many small munitions to crater the runways and mines to hamper repair operations. But this operation required the aircraft to directly overfly the target. Carried out at night, most of the tornado attacks were successful, despite intense flak and surface-to-air missiles. However, such was the scale of the anti-aircraft defences, three tornadoes were shot down in three successive nights. A lot of people have queried the need to go in at low level and carry out these attacks. We simply had no alternative. The JP-233 could not have been delivered from medium level. It had to be delivered from low level. And General Horner understood that. Uh, he and General Schwarzkopf had asked time and again for more tornadoes, more JP-233s. And that was the biggest capability that we brought to the party. And it was essential 
in those first few days of war that we quickly established air superiority and insofar as we were able, we kept the Iraqi Air Force on the ground. We were vulnerable on our own main basis for overcrowding. We had tens of thousands of troops arriving in theater and deploying forward to their combat assembly areas and we were vulnerable to air attack. And so we had to ensure that there was no air attack. Day four of the campaign brought a switch of tactics. The tornadoes went to medium level attacks, flying at around 10,000 feet and using free fall bombs against airfields and other targets. Playing a largely unsung combat support role, the Victor, TriStar and VC-10 tankers were essential to the British war effort. They ensured that each aircraft went into combat with a full fuel load and, crucially, at precisely the time required in their operational orders. Each heavily armed tornado needed two refuelings on the way to its target and one on its way back. This meant that the tankers had to fly near or even in Iraqi airspace to wait for the returning tornadoes. Having seen a certain number of aircraft go out and perhaps one less return, the tanker crews felt the loss of the tornadoes just as keenly as the bomber crews themselves. The Gulf was no picnic. Uh, a lot of people don't realize, because we obtained air superiority so quickly, that the Iraqi air defenses uh, were twice as dense as those we could have expected to face in Central Europe during the Cold War. They had a lot of missiles of one kind or another, and even more anti-aircraft artillery pieces. So it was not a benign environment, and it really was the air campaign plan, the way we had uh, planned to dismantle that huge Iraqi air defense system that was so successful. Because by day three we had air superiority, and certainly within a week or so we had total air supremacy. One of the true success stories of Desert Storm was the use of precision-guided munitions. Back at home, Viewers watching the war on television were stunned by the accuracy with which these weapons could hit a target, apparently without any damage to the surrounding area. Some of the most enduring images of the war were those of laser-guided bombs going down ventilation shafts. They'd been dropped by American F-117 stealth fighters attacking key targets in Baghdad. Another aspect of warfare is the impact of uh, television news coverage. For example, uh, Peter Arnett being in Baghdad. A lot of the young guys were upset about his reporting. Obviously, his reporting had to be slanted because he was being heavily censored. And if he was too fair or too balanced, he was liable to lose access to being in Baghdad. Now, I found it kind of interesting because what I could do is look over his shoulder as he made his reports and determine whether the weather was good enough for us to get our flights in that coming night. Uh, so it works both ways. RAF tornadoes began to drop laser-guided bombs, or LGBs, on the 2nd of February 1991, over two weeks into the campaign. LGBs detect the splash of laser light reflected off the target, a light that comes from an airborne laser designator. Providing the service initially for the tornado force was the veteran buccaneer. The tornado buccaneer duo became deadly, hitting bridges, hardened air shelters, and even Iraqi runways with unerring accuracy. Eight days later, the tornado force became operational with its own airborne laser designator, the GEC Marconi Tyal Pod, 
or thermal imaging airborne laser designator. The advent of precision weapons meant for the first time that we could carry out this sort of destructive, this strategic destruction with a conventional weapon, and we therefore didn't have to go through the areas of mass destruction that we would have had to have achieved using a nuclear weapon. So, for example, a command bunker that hitherto would have had a nuclear weapon allocated to it would now be destroyed by a precision munition going down an air shaft and causing mayhem on the operational floor. A significant part of coalition air operations in the later stages of the campaign had to be redirected to scud hunting, knocking out Saddam Hussein's relatively inaccurate short-range ballistic missiles. These weapons had great value as instruments of terror, and with scuds falling on and inflicting casualties in cities in Saudi Arabia and Israel, their destruction was seen as a priority to prevent Israel from entering the war and thus splitting the coalition. Once air superiority had been established, the plan called for attacks on tactical targets to soften up the battlefield prior to the land campaign. RAF Jaguars attacked the Iraqi army in Kuwait. As fighter bombers in the Second World War had harried German forces, so the Jaguars blew up ammunition and fuel dumps, tanks and missile sites. At 0400, on the 24th of February, Norman Schwarzkopf ordered his ground troops to move in. The land campaign was swift, around 100 hours. The Iraqi army surrendered. Kuwait had been liberated. The ground campaign, when it went in, was quicker than I had anticipated. And that illustrated to me the degree of effectiveness that air power had inflicted uh, in terms of attrition, morale, and all sorts of other things on the Iraqi army in the Kuwaiti theater. I mean, for the fourth largest army in the world to be overcome in the humiliating way that it was in a hundred hours is a good indication of that. There were many lessons to be learned from the Gulf War, but in the light of overwhelming success, military commanders warned against seizing obvious but possibly misleading conclusions which might be applied to future conflicts. Coalition forces had had six months to train and prepare for war. They would not always have this luxury in the future. Even today, controversy rages about direct low-level attacks on airfields. The RAF had lost six tornadoes, three of them on these attacks. The runway-busting bombs had proved effective, but it still seemed a high price to pay for success. However, the Jaguars had flown 600 combat sorties, mainly from around 10,000 feet, and not a single aircraft had been lost. These aging aircraft had played a small but significant role in destroying huge amounts of Iraqi armor and artillery. The war had also shown the power and accuracy of precision-guided munitions. It is a staggering fact that out of the thousands of tons of bombs dropped, just 9% were PGMs, but they caused 75% of the damage inflicted. One of the most important effects of what we call CNN news or the CNN effect on warfare is no longer will we be, we be allowed to conduct operations which are brutal, inhumane, and stupid. Uh, for example, the terror bombing of cities in Germany failed. It was also inhumane in retrospect. Uh, that's why there was so much importance placed on our attacks using precision munitions to the point where we even planned the attack so if the bomb that failed to guide, it would impact in, say, a parking lot rather than into a housing area. But possibly most of all, the Gulf War had proved that the United Nations could bring together many countries under one banner for a cause that all believed was right.
The need for increased flexibility was one of the key lessons of the Gulf War for the RAF. And it would not be long before the lessons learnt in the Gulf War were put to good use. In 1993, the United Nations ordered the policing of the skies over Bosnia-Herzegovina, an independent state recreated out of the breakup of Yugoslavia, which had descended into civil war. As part of Operation Deny Flight, Jaguars and Tornado F3s were sent to fly over Bosnia from their base in southern Italy, denying the Serbian aggressors the ability to launch their aircraft against Bosnian targets. Most important in the operation was the Boeing E3D Sentry. US Air Force sentries had proved invaluable in the Gulf and had finally been bought by the RAF. Based on the old Boeing 707 airframe and sporting a massive AWACS dish, they provided a much improved early warning capability than that of the Shackletons which had now been retired. Sentries clocked up over 9,000 hours in surveillance of the skies over Bosnia. Nimrods patrolled the waters of the Adriatic Sea to enforce the trade in Bangor. And tankers provided the much needed refueling capabilities. But this time, there was no clear political directive about prosecuting a war. Ceasefires came and went in frantic political efforts to end the conflict peacefully but to no avail. By the summer of 1995, after yet another aborted ceasefire, the continued slaughter of civilians and even the hijacking of United Nations equipment, NATO took direct action against the Serbs with Operation Deliberate Force. Serb gunnery positions, ammunition depots and communications installations were the targets of precision bombing. Once again, the laser-guided bombs showed their value at taking out key targets. After this NATO intervention, an uneasy peace descended on the region, but the potential for future conflict remains. After Bosnia, what became clear for the RAF was that its ability to fight at short notice in any location was paramount. To maintain this capability, the RAF is dependent on the skills of their pilots. They are trained for every eventuality and Cranwell is where that training starts. Cranwell has been the RAF Officer Cadet College since 1920. Thousands of would-be pilots have taken the training course there, but only the few go on to gain that most coveted of symbols, their wings. A prospective pilot will go through virtually the same progression as in those early days. Then, basic flying training was on the Abro 504, a biplane of pre-First World War vintage. Now, he learns on the Bulldog. The pilot's first few hours will be just as demanding and terrifying as they were for the thousands of young cadets who preceded him. Having learned basic navigation and control of piston-engined aircraft, the pilot progresses to ab initio training on the Shorts Tucano. This aircraft is a version of a Brazilian two-seat trainer, modified to meet the RAF's exacting standards. The Tucano provides the pilot with his first taste of what it might be like to fly in an aircraft with a cockpit configured like a fighter. The Tucano is an ideal aircraft for this role as it has similar jet-like flying characteristics to the British Aerospace Hawk, the RAF's advanced jet trainer. 
If the student pilot makes the grade, he or she will progress to RAF Valley in North Wales. There they will be introduced to the Hawk. This aircraft gives the pilot the chance to not only develop the skills needed to fly a fast jet, but also to learn how to fight in one. The British Aerospace Hawk is famous throughout the world as the aircraft flown by the RAF aerobatics team, the Red Arrows. The pinnacle of a pilot's ambition is to fly as a member of the Red Arrows. As we move forward in aviation, we're going to see things like unmanned aerial vehicles, and they're going to be used more and more and more. And people are going to believe you can take man out of war, put him in some safe bunker someplace, and have him manipulate computers in order to defeat the enemy. I think that is a wretched notion. Uh, the will of the individual in combat will still be the sustaining element towards victory in battle. We will still have people at the controls of their planes because there is nothing that can replace the human computer and there is nothing that can replace the initiative that the individual brings to battle. And with him on scene, be it dangerous, being involved, the loss of life, all that aside, still is the secret towards the employment of aircraft. But what will these pilots of tomorrow be flying? By the end of the century, the RAF will have an entirely improved collection of aircraft. Most of the types will be familiar, Tornado, Harrier and Jaguar, but in much upgraded versions. All the Tornado bombers will have access to the Tyald system. This version, the GR4, will also have advanced navigation systems. The latest Harrier, the GR7, is equipped for a night fighting role using its FLIR infrared system. The Jaguars, still in service after almost 25 years, continue in their effective ground attack role. Across the board, there will be simplified displays, providing instant information for the aircrew. The aircraft will be better defended. And possibly the most important development of all is new weaponry. Paveway 3, the latest generation of US laser-guided bombs, double the weight of current bombs, will be available. The RAF will also have new standoff missiles, weapons that are launched many miles from target with deadly accuracy. But the entirely new aircraft that will herald the incoming century will be the Eurofighter. The Eurofighter has been developed through the alliance of four European manufacturers. In appearance and performance, this aircraft harks back to the classic days of the dogfighter. It is much more than just a fighter, though. A multi-role aircraft, which first and foremost can perform extremely well in the air-to-air -air role, and then, as a read across, can perform equally well in the ground attack role. And that's what um, Eurofight have been designed to do. And it was one of the lessons, incidentally, which came out of the Gulf War, that um, the RAF would have really benefited from having a multi-role aircraft of this kind. Because in the early stages of war, you can use it for um, the air superiority missions that I've been describing, and then, hopefully, once you've obtained it, you can switch the aircraft to um, air-to-ground attacks. So the aircraft's going to have to be, uh, to some extent, a jack-of-all-trades. But that's not to say that it's going to be a master of none. Indeed, in the air superiority contest, I think it will be an outright uh, winner. Uh, and the reason it's going to be a winner is because not only will the aircraft of the future have extremes of maneuverability, uh, also it will have a clarity of view that will be unparalleled. And this doesn't mean that it just gets the information from its own radar, just like in the Battle of Britain, when we found that the integration of all the air defense systems enabled uh, uh, Air Marshal Dowding, for example, to have a view of the battle that was second to none. Now, in the modern era, each individual pilot will have that sort of view of the battle, and probably a better view of the battle than indeed Dowding had at the time of the Battle of Britain. But controversy still surrounds the whole project. Costs have spiraled, and no final delivery date has yet been agreed. Furthermore, it does not have the much-admired thrust-vectoring ability of its Russian competitors, such as the Sukhoi Su-37. However, whether such spectacular handling features will be effective in actual combat is questionable. 
the Eurofighter will have only limited stealth capabilities. This is the ability to fly undetected by enemy radar that the advanced American Lockheed Boeing F-22 boasts. The Eurofighter is unquestionably an important aircraft and one that will give the RAF the potential to match all known opponents. So what does the future hold for the RAF? Aircraft have the advantage of speed, range, maneuverability and perspective. These virtues are vital to Britain's ability to act in conflicts anywhere in the world. But perhaps the continued longevity of the RAF is assured by a single factor. The early pioneers such as Trenchard, Mitchell and Douay saw the potential not just of aviation but of air power, an independent force, not the servant of army or navy. A force able to deter an enemy or beat an enemy from the air and save the horrors and loss of life inherent in wars between armies. This was their dream. Today, air power is the military force that best represents the wishes and aspirations of the people it serves, because it offers the best means of protecting its people from the ravages of war. It is air power's potential to gain victory at a far smaller cost in life that is its great value. To sacrifice vast numbers of men in battles of attrition is not an option for a government accountable to its people. For as long as Britain remains a democracy, it will rely on the use of independent air power as a crucial component of its army. It will rely, as it has done for the last 80 years, on the Royal Air Force to battle for the sky. Typhoon was a superb ground attack aircraft which spearheaded the Allied advance through Europe in the last year of the war. Designed as a fighter, the Typhoon was almost withdrawn completely due to constant engine and airframe problems. However, once these were sorted out, it became one of the most feared weapons, flying devastating low level raids at high speeds against German targets. The Vickers Valiant was the first of the V-bombers when it entered service in 1955. It was designed to carry either the Redbeard tactical nuclear bomb or 10,000 pound Blue Danube strategic nuclear bomb as well as conventional weapons. Valiants were deployed to Suez in 1956 and performed well for what was still a new aircraft. Later, they were responsible for dropping Britain's first atomic and first hydrogen bombs at tests in Australia and Christmas Island. Unfortunately, their life was cut short by fatigue problems and they were hurriedly withdrawn by 1965. The de Havilland Vampire was Britain's second jet fighter, entering service in 1946. It was built in fighter, fighter bomber, night fighter and training variants. The last examples being withdrawn as late as 1969. With a top speed of 548 miles an hour, the Vampire was popular among both air and ground crews, being a good aerobatic aircraft easy to fly and easy to maintain. The Hanley Page Victor was the last of the V-bombers to enter service and the most versatile. This graceful crescent-winged aircraft had a capacious bomb bay allowing it to carry up to 35,000 pounds of bombs and an impressive performance with a top speed of 627 miles an hour and a range of 2,500 miles. 
From 1958 to 1968, the Victor was central to the RAF's nuclear bomber strategy. But it was withdrawn from duties when it was found that low-level flight created too much stress. But Victors continued in service as tankers and as late as 1991 provided vital refueling for Jaguars and Tornadoes during the Gulf War. Vickers Wildebeest was a biplane torpedo bomber which entered service in 1932 and it was still flown on operations in the Far East as late as 1942. Virtually obsolete by the outbreak of the war, the Wildebeests had to soldier on due to the late arrival of the Beaufort replacements. This 150 mile an hour aircraft continued to patrol the British coastline and despite heavy losses put up a gallant fight flying low level attacks from Singapore and Java against Japanese shipping. Vickers Vimy was a heavy bomber, built in the last months of the First World War to bomb Germany. However, Vimy's didn't enter service until 1919, and orders for 1,500 were drastically reduced to just 200. Powered by Rolls-Royce Eagle engines, the Vimy had a top speed of only 100 miles an hour, but it could carry a bomb load of 2,500 pounds, and it had a range of almost 1,000 miles. Unlike most of the other heavy bomber types built for the war, Vimy's survived the post-war cuts and continued in service until 1933, initially as bombers and transports, and finally as trainers. Probably the most famous exploits of the Vimy, though, were the two long-distance flights by Alcock and Brown across the Atlantic and the Smith brothers from Britain to Australia, both in 1919. Gavro Vulcan was the second and most famous of the three V bombers to enter service with the Royal Air Force. With its distinctive delta wing design, the Vulcan became the backbone of Britain's nuclear bomber force until the job of delivering the nuclear deterrent passed on to the Royal Navy in 1968. 134 Vulcans were built at the Avro factories in Woodford and Manchester the B Mark II having a maximum speed of 645 miles an hour and a service ceiling of 55,000 feet. Vulcans stayed in service as conventional bombers until their planned replacement by tornadoes in 1982. But they added a final glorious chapter to their life during the Falklands War when they flew long-range strikes against Stanley Airport a round trip of 7,700 miles from Ascension Island, being refueled by a whole succession of Victor tankers during the flights.
the supermarine walrus, or shagbat as it was known, was designed as a catapult aircraft for ships, but was most famously used as an air-sea rescue amphibian. 250 walruses were eventually to serve with the RAF from 1941 until 1946, when they were replaced by sea otters. The Westland Wapiti was a general-purpose biplane that was variously used as a bomber and reconnaissance aircraft. Although they gave faithful service in home-based squadrons, they are undoubtedly best known for their long and grueling years of service in India and Iraq. In hot, dusty conditions across deserts and mountains, Wapitis served from 1929 until 1940, equipping no less than 10 squadrons throughout the empire. These rugged aircraft were a modest improvement over the First World War vintage types they replaced, but their adaptability became invaluable in areas where spares were in very short supply. The Vickers Wellesley was the first aircraft to be built around Barnes Wallace strong geodetic design. Entering service in 1937, Wellesley's equipped six bomber squadrons before being withdrawn from the UK in 1939 and redeployed to the Middle East and East Africa. Their most famous exploit was in 1938 when two Wellesleys flew non-stop from Egypt to Australia over 7,000 miles in 48 hours. The Vickers Wellington formed the backbone of Bomber Command's night raids over Europe in the first years of the Second World War. Built with the geodetic construction method, the Wellington was an immensely strong aircraft that could survive many hits from flak and return to base safely. During their operational life, Wellingtons dropped over 40,000 tons of bombs on enemy targets. But the Wellington was far from obsolete, and in 1942, it began a new life in coastal command as a reconnaissance bomber sinking 51 enemy submarines. The Wellington was also built in larger numbers than any other bomber in the RAF's history, a total of 11,000 460. The Westland Wessex was a transport and ground attack helicopter which entered service with the RAF in 1964. With a top speed of 132 miles an hour and a range of over 450 miles, the Wessex could carry 16 fully armed troops or a load of up to 4,000 pounds. They were used in Northern Ireland on anti-terrorist duties and in Cyprus as part of the UN peacekeeping force. But they're probably best known as the all-yellow painted air-sea rescue helicopters that have saved countless military and civilian lives from the sea and cliff faces all over the UK.